per a, about a quart or liter of water per ton of lunar material, and that's lunar material in the top part of the, the surface, the top couple of millimeters. The detection uh, results in a very small absorption band that is shown here in gray on this graph, and you see uh, results from two instruments, the M cube and, and VIMS, give very close to the same answer, which is uh, what we were looking for to verify that the calibration is accurate between the instruments. Um, further, the M cube doesn't go as far out in wavelength as the VIMS or the deep impact uh, spacecraft does. So the VIMS and deep impact can see water uh, in hotter places than is easy for the M cube instrument to see it. Uh, we will continue to work with the M cube data to tr try and uh, uh, work on detecting water at lower latitudes, but the VIMS and the deep impact uh, have an advantage here. Uh, and you can see that we see more of the water band, so we can better define it where the heat is coming out. The moon is quite hot, so these red dashed lines on there are the thermal emission from the moon before we removed it from the spectra. So we have to remove the heat before we can see the water well, especially at the lower latitudes. Now, M cube, however, has uh, an advantage in that it's orbiting the moon, so if we can go to the next slide, we'll uh, look at some of the high resolution data or the uh, We've covered most of the moon at this kind of resolution, 140 meters per pixel. And this is a small crater on the far side. That's on the uh, right or left-hand side of the image here. Um, and on the left is shown just the infrared intensity, but on the, the right is shown our derived uh, water abundance. So we see this, this uh, meteor has come in probably within the last 100 million years and exploded the surface and spewed that material out onto the surface, and we see that uh, with M cube as a water-rich ejecta blanket. Now, that's only part of the story. The, the, the ejecta blanket and water-rich nature of it goes in all directions, but in a moment, we're going to put on the hydroxyl, and you'll see the hydroxyl doesn't go in all directions. Here, well, it just came up. The hydroxyl uh, comes out mainly at the 1 o'clock and 7 o'clock position. This is typical when a meteor comes in and uh, ejects material from the surface that is buried in the surface. So if this interpretation is correct, and we'll be studying this further, this implies that uh, these recently fresh uh, uh, or young craters have excavated water and hydroxyl-rich material in the surface, and that implies that there is areas around the moon where there's uh, more water than just on the surface. We see a lot of these craters. Carly showed some other indications of some even, even smaller ones. There are also craters that don't show this effect. So uh, there's a lot of different interpretations to do, and we have a lot of work to do to go through the M-cube data and uh, perhaps future missions. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jessica. Thanks, Roger. Um, I'm going to share with you the results from observations from the Deep Impact spacecraft. Since July 4th of 2005 uh, and our successful impact experiment, with the Comet Temple 1, uh, the Deep Impact team has been on an extended mission, which will be culminating uh, in just over a year from now in a flyby of the Comet Hartley 2. Uh, along the way, we've made several observations of the moon for calibration purposes. Uh, and while our spectrometer was obviously designed for cometary observations, it is ideally suited uh, for measuring the OH and H2O absorption features that you've heard described at 3 microns. So if I could have my first uh, graph, please. Uh, in purple on the left, you see uh, the location of data that we collected in 2007 uh, over the equator. And then in blue, uh, the northern polar regions uh, that were collected this past June. On the right, uh, you see the corresponding spectra. And with the deep impact spectrometer, we now unequivocally see the entire uh, water and OH absorption feature. And that's the areas that are shaded. Uh, the feature is relatively strong in the blue polar regions, uh, whereas at the equator, which is the data in purple, uh, which of course is much warmer, there is still a, a distinct feature, but it's much weaker. Now, we can explore this variability uh, in more detail looking at the full range of the data that was collected in June of this year. And if I could have the next chart, please. On the left is a, a location image uh, with Clementine data showing our vantage point uh, looking at the northern polar regions. Uh, right next to it is a, the black and white brightness image, uh, which is uh, 
constructed from the deep impact spectra. It shows you the, the two basic uh, lunar materials, the bright highlands and the dark uh, volcanic maria. Uh, I should point out that we took this data uh, from a vantage point of eight million kilometers away, which is a little bit different than M cubed, which had an advantage uh, of spatial resolution because Chandrayaan-1 was in a 100 kilometer orbit above the moon, which makes a great uh, comparative data set. Uh, in orange, you see the temperature map that we derive from our data. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, you can see that it's warmest on the right because that's where the sun is. Uh, once we remove these uh, thermal effects, as Roger explained, uh, we can then measure the overall strength of the absorption features. Uh, and you can see there's a significant variability in this water signature. We have the strongest uh, amounts of water uh, on the left in uh, red and the weakest on the right in blue. And if you look at all three of these images together, you can see that the water signature is not correlated to brightness. It's not correlated to uh, the terrain types, but it is very correlated to temperature. So if I could have the next graphic, please. Um, it turns out that we uh, were very lucky uh, in June because we happened to take observations twice, on the 2nd and the 9th. And in that one week of terrestrial time, which is a quarter of a day on the moon, the moon rotated 90 degrees. And this allows us to look at the uh, strength of the absorption features as a function of time of day. So for example, uh, in the upper left, you'll see a dark miry region labeled M which is in the morning on June 2nd. It is just rotated into sunlight. Uh, but on June 9th, uh, on the lower left, you can see that it is uh, near local noon. Uh, similarly, we can look at one of the highland units, uh, which are labeled in H, the, uh, in black and H. Uh, they started on June 2nd uh, at noon, but by the 9th uh, have now almost rotated out of sunlight uh, and are in the evening. And if we look at the spectral properties, for example, of this highlands unit, we find some interesting results. Uh, at noon, shown in red in the, on the right plot, uh, the absorption is relatively weak. Uh, but in the evening, we have a much stronger 3 micron absorption. Uh, and there's also actually a difference in the change in shape. And what we found when we looked at all of our data was a very systematic pattern uh, where we had strong absorptions in the morning. They weakened uh, as we approached noon and then increased again uh, in the afternoon. And finally, by evening, had returned to the same steady state that they started with in the morning. And so uh, the important point here is that we're seeing an entire cycle of uh, loss and recovery of water features uh, that's, that's occurring during the daytime. And in the next slide, I'll try to give at least one explanation for what might be going on. Uh, this is a, a, a schematic uh, illustrating just one possible uh, explanation of our observations. Uh, during the daytime, the moon is exposed to the solar wind, which includes hydrogen ions. Uh, so if you look on the lower left in the morning, which is relatively cold, the blue and the green areas, uh, the hydrogen ions are able to interact with the oxygen in the lunar soil uh, to form and accumulate OH and H2O molecules. By noon in the center, where the moon is its warmest, the red areas, uh, there is significant water loss. Then, as the moon cools down towards evening, it's able to once again uh, interact with the solar wind uh, and uh, accumulate water and H2O molecules. And we end up at the same place that we started in the morning. Uh, this cycle means uh, a number of things, one of which is that regardless of the location or the terrain type, the entire surface of the moon will be hydrated during, during at least part of the lunar day. Uh, I'd also like to note that uh, if this is actually uh, the explanation for the water signature that we've all been talking about, and it may not be, but if it is, uh, this same process would uh, cause the, uh, similar hydration effects throughout the inner solar system on any oxygen-rich body that doesn't have an atmosphere. And that would include, for example, Mercury uh, and many asteroids. And with that, I'll pass it back to Jim. Thank you very much, Jessica. So as you can see, there's a new dimension in the water story about the moon. We've discussed things that aren't in permanently shadowed craters. However, we find that uh, there are a number of important scientific results that we need to make sure get stated appropriately. So the takeaway message is this. 
The observations presented here 